Welcome back to the afternoon session. Uh, the first talk in the session is by Dheeraj Nagaraj, who is a research scientist at Google Research. And uh, Dheeraj has done very interesting works in both probability and optimization. And today he'll be talking about Stein variational gradient descent. What do you, Dheeraj? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Okay. So, yeah, so we had a nice uh, lecture by Linaik in the, in the morning about um, particle methods to optimize uh, functionals of uh, probability distributions. So this is uh, the, the application, main application in mind was uh, training neural networks. Now I'll be talking about particle methods to do sampling. Uh, specifically, I'll be talking about the algorithm called Stein variational gradient descent, which has uh, become important in the last few years and has been studied a lot. Uh, this is joint work with Aniket Das, who's a pre-doc at uh, Google. Okay, so let me introduce the problem of sampling in RD, the real space in D dimensions. Okay, so we have Oracle access to a potential function f from rd to r, it's re it takes real values. Okay, so we want to approximate the target density pi star of x proportional to uh, e to the minus f of x using finite samples. What I mean is that, okay, we, uh, we want to get, uh, let's say, samples from this distribution, which are IAD distributed uh, as this distribution. Okay, this is a fundamental problem in a lot of areas. For instance, in ML and statistics, uh, it is uh, at the center, heart of uh, Bayesian inference and generative models. Um, in theoretical computer science, uh, we have volume computation and algorithmic geometry and so on, where this is central. Um, in statistical physics, where most of these uh, techniques are inspired from, this is uh, uh, how they describe Gibbs measure and uh, partition function approximation uh, is helpful to uh, understand various physical properties. Um, and in differential privacy, where sampling from the exponential mechanism is a primary way of ensuring uh, differential privacy of our learning task. Okay, the prototypical algorithm used in sampling of such art is called Langevin Monte Carlo. So this is a, um, we, we simulate a Markov, a Markov chain whose stationary distribution is close to the target pi star. So it, it looks like this, this is basically a stochastic a gradient descent along uh, you know, the function, potential function F plus a very large Gaussian noise. Uh, here it is of the order eta, and then uh, the Gaussian noise is uh, typically of the order square root eta. So this should be seen as a discretization of a stochastic differential equation rather than uh, the you know, approximation of a flow. Okay, so th there is a lot of nice non-asymptotic convergence analysis under isoparameter conditions, and uh, we know exactly when it, we can hope uh, that it converges. Okay, uh, what I want to discuss today is an alternative to this uh, work cause that is uh, Stein variational gradient descent which was uh, introduced by Liu and Wang. So it's something like this. So we have a PSD kernel, uh, kernel in the sense of the RKHS space kernel, okay? So which is a function from RD times RD to R. And we have some initial particles, X0 to Xn, which are all IID distributed as some initial distribution mu naught. let's say it's a Gaussian. Um, okay, so the algorithm is to simulate a deterministic interacting particles, uh, particle dynamics. Or what happens here is that, okay, there's the ith particle, and at time t plus one, we take the particle ith particle at time t and move it by this amount. What is this amount? This, uh, this contains various interactions terms with various other particles. So what happens is that we have a particle at time t, it looks at the positions of all other particles, and then computes how it interacts with them, uh, attraction, repulsion, et cetera, and then moves along that direction. Okay? So that, that's an interacting particle dynamics. And then what we do is we uh, output uh, the empirical distribution after a long amount of time, and we hope that it approximates uh, the target distribution, pi star in some sense. Okay, so what, in what sense is this approximately equal to is also an uh, active question of research, and, in, um, and we'll encounter this. This seems like a mysterious equation for now. I'll, uh, throughout this talk, I'll explain to you why this equation comes up and how we can guarantee that this actually converges. Which one there? Yeah, this is the empirical measure of the particles. Here. Uh, grad two, yeah. Grad two is, okay, it's a bivariate function, right? X comma Y, it's a gradient with respect to the second set of variables. It's not the Hessian, it's the, right? You can write it as K of X comma Y, right? It's a function of two different things. You can take the derivative with respect to Y, first derivative with respect to Y, and it's a vector in RD. Yes. Yes. Yes, they are related in some way. This is like a same, same way that gradient descent is related to projected gradient descent. 
like you project the gradient onto some subspace yeah here uh, here no this is a time t right for every i i equals 0 to n or 1 to n you prefer this yeah so these are n different particles okay maybe i'll go to the next uh, slide okay so it looks something like this each i indexes each different particle t indexes how they move in time right so x i t is the position of particle i at time t right okay so as you can see if this is like uh, the uh, the density function you know so this would uh, your particle system is fairly uniformly distributed across the space and then it uh, it then becomes you know distributed as similar to your target density here but just by interacting with other particles okay. okay so the nice thing about this which a lot of people liked when it came out in 2016 was that it's a deterministic time evolution and initialization is the only source of randomness in the in the longevan dynamics we had to add a brownian motion noise uh, increment at every step but we don't have to do that here so it's just that we initialize it randomly and then just using that randomness we are able to extract a randomness which looks like the target right and uh, this this is phenomenon is in general called propagation of chaos that is there is some amount of randomness initially and then you do some operations on it and you'll still see a bunch of random particles distributed as you want so it is seen that it has a lot of nice practical applications right for instance it outperforms LNC in, LMC in many practical applications like Bayesian inference, generative models, reinforcement learning, and federated learning, and so on. Uh, Longevan Monte Carlo, the stochastic differential equation I showed you. Right. Okay. So, however, this is not very well understood. Okay. The prior result, like all particle methods, this is a mean. Uh, this is a particle approximation of some probability distribution flowing in the space of probability distributions. Uh, probability distributions live in an infinite dimensional space of course we can't write uh, dynamics that we can't even store it in a computer so we'll have to write down these n particles and hope that we can approximate the probability distribution with this finitely supported measure and uh, however mean field result mean field limit you know converges to the uh, target very easily and it can be shown using uh, the concept of uh, Wasserstein gradient flows and so on which i, I hope uh, linaik will talk about in the uh, next few lectures uh, but Right, so the, the analysis is quite straightforward once you know the framework of, uh, of Wasserstein gradient flows. However, when you have this finite system of n particles, it is very, very complex, and it's uh, they're so complica complexly dependent that it's very hard to analyze. In fact, writing some of the functionals in which you can write in the infinite n limit, it's infinity for all finite n, like KL divergence to the target, for instance. Right, so it's not very clear how to analyze this in the finite particle limit. Yet this is quite successful in practice. So recent uh, non-asymptotic rates in uh, in a measure called Kernelstein discrepancy, which I'll introduce in a few slides, showed that okay, so Kernelstein discrepancy for the target is polynomial of d divided by square root of log log n to the power one over d. So that is, you take the particles, there are n particles, you take their empirical measure, and then measure its Kernelstein discrepancy to the target, and you would get a upper bound of a poly of d divided by square root of log log n to the power one over d. Okay, so this not only suffers from a curse of dimensionality that is n needs to be exponential indeed to have any sense there is a there is this huge log log factor here as well which makes the result uh, for any practical n uh, or even if it's the number of particles in the universe it's not very uh, practical right? so the question we ask is why does it work well when n equals 20 right it works very well okay so in the next question okay i won't be answering this question because it's very hard but I'll be answering the second question. Okay, can we arrive at, at uh, you know variants which uh, converge provably fast with finite number of particles? Right. Uh, we we will massage this equation a bit. We'll change the dynamics a little bit. It converges to the similar mean field limit. But then yeah, please. A polynomial in dimension. It uh, d is the latent dimension in which the particles live. Like R d. Right. So in this talk, we'll focus on deriving variants of this, which probably con uh, converge in some sense. Okay. okay. So like I said, uh, to be able to do that, let's derive SVGD and uh, let's try to tinker with it and uh, see what we can do. 
Okay, so uh, we have the Wasserstein space P2 of Rd. This is the space of probability measures on Rd uh, with finite second moment. And this is equ equipped with the Wasserstein metric. I hope everyone is aware of the Wasserstein 2 metric. Uh, right? So this is uh, conveniently uh, described here, infimum over all couplings x minus y squared d lambda of x y. Now, uh, we understand optimization quite well, uh, and we want to uh, we have view this from the sense of optimization. So we can see the sampling as an optimization over a space of probability distributions. What is this functional we are trying to optimize? It is the KL divergence from pi star. Let's call this h of mu is equal to KL of mu to pi star. Okay? So if we figure out how to optimize this uh, functional in the space of distributions, then hopefully we'll get a sampling algorithm. Right? And that's how SVGD is. Uh, Derived, and we know that pi star is the unique minimizer of this. So we know that h of mu is a convex functional of mu. So maybe we can use, use gradient descent to optimize this. But gradient descent is in this infinite dimensional uh, space, infinite dimensional manifold, uh, the, that of the space of probability distributions. Okay, so we'll introduce uh, this algorithm called Wasserstein gradient descent. Uh, here, what we'll do is uh, mu t plus one is identity minus gamma times gt, gt is some function, push forward of mu t. What does this mean? We draw um, a draw xt, which is distributed as mu t. And then what I'll do is uh, I'll get xt plus one is equal to xt minus gamma gt of xt. That is, we take, get xt plus one as a sample from the push forward of uh, xt, uh, the law of xt with respect to this function, identity minus gamma gt. So we, we can, uh, uh, by using uh, the theory of uh, Wasserstein gradient flows, we can show this uh, uh, Taylor approximation kind of thing. So here, what we have is that if you have mu t plus one, which is uh, after doing a, gra a gradient descent in the space of probability distributions, uh, uh, h of mu t plus one minus uh, h of mu t is less than or equal to minus gamma uh, g t inner product grad log mu t over pi star. Okay, in, yeah. No, this, yes, no, if you have finite space, as in finite number of spaces, then I guess it would be like that, but I don't know if optimal transport has been studied in that sense. So this, uh, this, this gradient descent in the space is in the space of probability distributions, right? So it's already in infinite dimensional. But in finite dimensions, we can write it like this. Yeah. Yeah. Correct, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll get there. Yeah, pi star is unknown. We have access, we know that it is proportional to e to the minus f, right? A, we know the potential function. The problem is with the normalizing constant. We have no idea what that constant is. And we, if you try to integrate any function against this, we end up with a curse of dimensionality, right? So that's why we need samples and then maybe use law of large numbers to approximate the expectation of those functions. A push forward, uh, which I've explained here, uh, what that means is that if xt is distributed as mu t, then mu t plus one is the law of xt minus gamma gt of xt. That's the push forward measure of mu t. Yeah. Oh, we haven't chosen what gt is yet. That's what we want to choose. So in gradient descent, you pick the direction where you decrease the value of the function the most. We don't know what that value is. We're trying to pick that value. Wasserstein gradient, yeah, 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 this one, yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, so we can, uh, you know, fresh air differential derivative and stuff. We can write a first order expansion. Okay, if you attain the small, when the step size is small, if I perturb it by a little bit, if I do a push forward, how much will my functional change in a certain domain? So that's the question. Okay, so 
uh, similar to that, so we have this functional h mu t plus one minus h of mu t. We can write this Taylor series kind of thing. Okay, so here uh, the uh, uh, the metric is in L two of mu t locally, right? So we we can show that this is minus gamma inner product of g t with respect to this gradient log mu t over pi star, right? So we we know that if I if I do if I apply this operation for any sufficiently well behaved g t, this is how uh, how much my function uh, of interest would change, right? So uh, let's assume that gamma is quite small, so the second order term can be ignored for now. Okay, so what is the best choice of GT? It uh, okay, so uh, best choice of GT would be you know grad log mu t over pi star. Okay, so this is called the Wasserstein gradient. Okay. So uh, this uh, this behaves like the gradient. So best choice of GT would be picking that to be equal to grad log of mu t over pi star. Okay, so there is a question: Where is the target coming in? The target is coming in here in the gradient here in the denominator. We can evaluate that function because we know f that just becomes grad f, which we have oracle access to. However, there is a problem here. Okay, so even though the ideal choice of this is the Wasserstein gradient, this is not easily computable. In fact, we don't know how to compute it unless we have infinite number of particles, right? Because uh, there is a gradient of log of the density function, right? And uh, we have no idea how to compute it. So, uh, writing an algorithm of this form seems infeasible, right? Uh, so the, uh, okay, but uh, uh, doing that is actually equivalent to uh, Langevin Monte Carlo, right? Uh, so as we can see, if we don't do any further steps and try to implement, this is uh, happens to describe the evil time evolution of KL divergence under the Langevin dynamics, the stochastic differential equation. So that's why we, you need to add randomness at every step. Yeah. Over. No, no, it will be maximized, right? It's in the same direction. It's the gradient is in this direction. The inner product is maximized in this direction when you choose G in this direction. So, so therefore, this results in the maximum decrease in the function value we are, which we are trying to minimize. Okay, so the main idea that Liu and Wang had in their 2016 paper is that we want to project this Wasserstein gradient into a super suitable RKHS, right? Where uh, we don't, we can use integration by parts and get rid of this grad log mu t. Okay, so if you have particles, it's easy to get expectations of certain functionals and drive this. But if you want derivative of the probability density, then it's not hard to do that. So we want to exchange this derivative uh, and pass it on to the kernel by using a change of variables formula and just keep expectations. Right? And then that gives us the interacting particle dynamics. So this is the uh, time evolution equation, the like the Taylor series expansion, let's say. Okay, so we want, like I said, we want to restrict GT to be in a suitable RKHS space, okay, with a kernel K. Uh, when K is sufficiently well behaved, uh, you know, this GT can be included in the L2 of mu T for every mu T. So we write GT is equal to I mu T of GT bar, that is where I mu T is the inclusion operator. It's the same function, but we change the inner product from RKHS to L2 of mu t, right? So we, we write this in GT bar in RKHS. Now uh, we, we, we look at this functional which we wanted to maximize. Okay, what, how can I pick GT such that this is uh, positive? This is as large as positive, but this has restricted to be in the RKHS. So this uh, turns out it is GT times this is equal to I mu t GT bar in our product this just by the definition of GT bar. Now let's consider the adjoint of this inclusion operator i mu star, right? So if I if I shift the i mu t to i mu t star on the other side, we change the inner product to the uh, RKHS inner product, okay? and then we we get this representation. So we change the metric here from uh, so the inner product from L two of mu t inner product to the Hilbert space inner product by using this adjoint operation. Okay? So now what is the best choice for GT, right? So uh, the, this must be equal to i mu t star of grad log mu t over pi star. So this is just the projection of the, in some sense of the gradient to the RKHS, right? And we know the closed form for the adjoint operator, which is basically smoothing by this kernel, the smooth version of this uh, by this kernel, if we look at it. So it is actually integral k of x comma y grad log mu t over pi star d mu t of y. Okay? So this is just the answer. Okay? And then uh, we know that, okay, there are two terms here. There's grad log mu t and grad log pi star. 
we know what gradlock pi star is because uh, pi star is proportional to e to the minus f of x. So gradlock pi star is uh, grad f of y, right? So we know how to evaluate gradlock one over pi star. The problematic term was gradlock mu t. Now we use integration by parts and shift the derivative to k of x comma y, and write this as a uh, write this as a uh, integral of grad grad of k of x comma y with respect to d mu t. Yeah. So the, now we we know what what we we have a good candidate of what we want to pick, uh, of what function to pick, so that we can write down uh, the uh, gradient descent or what's the projected what's time gradient descent in the space of probability distributions. Okay. So the main aspect is that it does not involve the gradient of the density. Okay. Let's consider the mean field SVGD. Let's, uh, we got the expression for the projected gradient in the previous slide, which was h mu of x is equal to integral k of x comma y grad f of uh, y d mu of y minus gra uh, gradient with respect to the second argument uh, k of x comma y d mu of y. So this is the projection of the gradient. And then the projected gradient descent in the space of measures is mu t plus one is identity minus gamma h mu t push forward of mu t. Right, so we apply this function to a random variable distributed as this, and the distribution of the next uh, iterate is mu t plus one. Okay, so this has been this has been well studied. In fact, Salim et al. in twenty twenty one showed that uh, um, convergence of mean field SVGD in Kernelstein discrepancy. It's a measure kernelized measure which can be easily computed. Okay, Kernelstein discrepancy is nothing but uh, the uh, norm in the RKHS norm of this H mu. If you look at this as a projected gradient, uh, this is like a first order stationarity condition, right? If, uh, if this becomes zero, that means that uh, mu t plus one is equal to mu t, right? So this is kind of a first order stationarity condition. Um, so it implies weak convergence under certain assumptions on RKHS. So therefore, if uh, we know that if h mu is equal to zero, then mu, uh, then mu t must be equal to pi star, right? So this, uh, this is kind of a weak notion of convergence. Okay, so the analysis of Salim et al. is basically the analysis of gradient descent, right? So we, we had this Taylor series expansion, and what they show is that um, uh, the KL divergence of mu t plus one to pi star is less than or equal to KL of mu t to pi star minus two gamma times KSD square of mu t to pi star, right? So this is basically the analysis of gradient descent. This is the norm gradient squared, and then uh, we rearrange this and show that this average KSD square is at it is decays as one over gamma t. You pick gamma to be like uh, say O of one, and then you get a one over t convergence rate for this average KSD square kind of quantity. Okay, so we know that in some sense it converges to the target. Uh, it, it, this is not as strong as uh, saying that uh, Longo one Monte Carlo converges in KL divergence to the target exponentially fast, but this is still something because uh, it's not as mysterious as it was anymore. Okay. Uh, do you have any questions? Yes, uh, so because we restricted the gradients to a kernel space, because we wanted to use a change of variables formula so that we don't have to um, estimate the, the gradient of a certain density, which we have no idea about. Right. Yes, we will convert to a stationary point in terms of this. And in fact, H mu being equal to zero means that mu equals pi star. That's what I was saying. Yeah. We do have convergence in some metric, but the question about metric is still iffy, and it's a matter of research. Right? Uh, I mean, people are trying to derive convergence in stronger metrics than KSD. This is easy to compute, but it's a bit mysterious. So yeah, ideally we would want to have convergence in KL or TV or something like that. 
Okay, so the state of the art convergence for this is, uh, uh, you know, d to the three fourth divided by square root t for KSD, right? Because you take the square root here and then uh, you get the answer. Okay, we saw what the straightforward particle approximation was. Right? Uh, we took the approximate the distribution mu t with the empirical distribution mu t hat of n, n, n particles. Okay, so and then we write mu t plus one is equal to identity minus gamma h mu t hat push forward of mu t hat. Right, so we can just replace wherever we saw mu t, we replace it with mu t hat and everything stays the same. So in the path space, what this means is that we draw x01 to x n iid from the distribution mu0. There are n particles distributed as the initial distribution. And then we update it as the following, that is xt plus one i minus is equal to xt i minus gamma over n times this quantity. This quantity is nothing but h mu t hat of xt i. Okay. So this is how we derived SVGD in the first place. Okay, so now um, uh, the, we have this. So to analyze this, we want to say that, okay, when n is 20 or something, we're still getting good approximation. Okay, so what is the problem here? The problem is that uh, we use KL divergence, we track the KL divergence of the measures to the target before. This happens to be infinity for any particle approximation. Right? So the, we can't hope to approximate pi star in KL with, with using this finite number of particles. The second uh, problem is that the particles are not independent of each other after t equals zero. They're horribly dependent on each other and it's very hard to even mathematically describe how they're dependent. Okay, and we call this the bootstrap problem because we are using the particles to estimate this h mu t and then also updating the same particles, right? We cannot guarantee the quality of SVGD updates. We don't know if, uh, if they are good enough to approximate the Wasserstein gradient at time t. And like I said, the dynamics of the particle law is hard to track because complex interparticle dependencies, right? So we don't know what is happening there. Okay, so the current approach, which is uh, which was the state of the art, is that uh, we track the deviation between SVGD and mean field SVGD in the Wasserstein distance. We don't care about the uh, KL divergence. We just track this in uh, in the Wasserstein distance, and uh, hopefully it converges after a certain point. We get non-trivial convergence. Okay. So for what they obtain is that KSD pi star between mu t hat to pi star is of the order poly of d divided by square root of log log n to the power one over d, like I said. Okay, so the, what the strategy when, when pi star is sub Gaussian. So this is very, very weak because there's a log log and also a curse of dimensionality because even for this to work, n has to be at least uh, super exponential in, in the dimension. And uh, this cannot explain the practical performance of finite particle SVGD. And um, like I said, it explicitly tracks the mean field limit mu t with finite number of particles, which is mu t hat in the Wasserstein distance. And uh, even if log log is improved, it suffers from curse of dimensionality. The story so far, uh, just to remind you, uh, is that we considered SVGD, which is a projected or kernelized gradient descent in the space of probability distributions. This is implemented as a finite particle approximation. Infinite particle limit is fairly well un understood in some sense of well understood. Um, but finite pro, pro, uh, particle approximation is poorly understood. So now we get to the main topic of the talk in the last half, that is, uh, can we discretize the infinite particle limit in order to obtain provably fast guarantees in the finite particle regime, right? Okay, so I'll slightly tinker with the algorithm, I'll change it, and I'll obtain n particles in, in the output. Can I ensure that it, it still, uh, it approximates the distribution pi star in a nice way, like we would expect? So our contribution here is called virtual particle SVGD, right? Uh, it, okay, so this is a stochastic approximation um, in the space of probability measures to so the dynamics of mean field SVGD. We are not approximating the finite particle limit. We are just directly stochastic approximating the mean field SVGD uh, with finite number of particles. Uh, this is conceptually different from, you know, path space stochastic approximations like in SGLD. In SGLD, there might be uncertainty in the score function. Uh, we, we have stochastic approximation in the path space. That is for each in the update, there's an unbiased estimator for let's say grad F or something or for the gradient, but uh, that is in the path space, but this actually is in the space of probability distributions. Okay. This also allows the tracking of KL divergence of a finite particle system 
with a slight mathematical conceptual trick and um, outputs conditionally iid samples from a measure which is close in target uh, close to the uh, target in ksd okay so this is important because if you have a high dimensional distribution if you want to estimate uh, approximate it with an empirical distribution you typically need exponential number of particles because of the curse of dimensionality there are too many uh, uh, open balls of constant radius uh, so well, what we want to do is that okay so if we however uh, get n particles which are iid from the target we can estimate certain a finite number of statistics quite well we might not be able to get a wasserstein distance bound but we can do most of statistics and inference with uh, let's say 100 particles or 1000 okay. okay so uh, before i describe uh, vps vgd so let's look at the dynamics again so we have mu t plus 1 is equal to identity minus gamma h mu t push forward of mu t right so here there are uh, two things to track right one is the uh, the gradient wasserstein gradient or h mu t and the measure itself that is mu t right so if we use the same set of particles to approximate both we end up with complex dependencies so let's try to solve that so we consider two types of particles one is called the virtual particles that is to approximate h mu t and the real particles to approximate mu t right so this is kind of uh, related the at least the nomenclature is related to quantum field theory where you know there, there are, there's an interacting particle system evolving and the interactions are carried out by these fictitious virtual particles which ex exist only mathematically but then what are observed are just you know the real particles right. so it's just a you know fancy name um okay so based on that intuition let's consider something called the lower triangular dynamics so we have all these particles you know like i say 10 or something particles here two types of particles the real particles and the virtual particles right the top ones are virtual these are real at time equals 0 they're all identically distributed and independent at time equals 1 i'll sacrifice the first virtual particle and compute h mu not or approximate uh, h mu not and then i'll run the dynamics for t equals 1 right for for t equals 1 i don't have to consider the first particle it's just gone it we just don't consider it ever again okay and then we get these a uh, new particles at time equals 1 and then i take this uh, next virtual particle i use it to approximate h mu 1 and then i'll de destroy that particle and then consider the dynamics on the rest of them and then so on and so forth i keep on sacrificing a virtual particle at every time step until i get uh, the output at t equals 5 which are only the real particles right i don't output the virtual particles right um so i claim that this is a nice stochastic approximation of the um, of the mean field svg okay so this is written in the algorithmic form here we have a uh, batch size k uh, and we, we don't have to just use one virtual particle every time we can use k virtual particles every time and we can just use batch size k okay so now let's uh, think about the analysis okay uh, in mean field svgd we track the evolution of kl divergence in the finite particle regime uh, this was infinity for every finite part, uh, finitely supported measure um what do we do okay so we observe that uh, conditioned on these two virtual particles right we see that all these particles are iid from some distribution right if if we know knew the position of these two virtual particles these are iid right uh, because this this uh, well, these particles are functions of the the initial condition Uh, and these two virtual particles so when you con uh, when you condition these out the rest of them are iid right so there is some iid structure here which we want to exploit okay so more formally if we take xti to be the position of particle i at time t we see that xt t plus 1 to xt of t plus n are iid conditioned on x not 1 to x not t that is given the first t virtual particles at time 0 the t plus 1 to t plus nth particle are iid okay, so the natural candidate for tracking the evolution is the conditional law that is the law of xt of t plus 1 conditioned on x not 1 to x not t right so we will track the kl divergence of this particle and then conditionally we will get independent samples based on this lemma at the end of the algorithm uh, for short hand we'll denote this as mu t given ft where ft is the sigma algebra of the first t virtual particles at time 0 Uh, we note that this is at time zero, not at time t. Okay. 
Okay, so therefore, this is a random probability distribution. Just like in SGD, we have a, a stochastic uh, parameter which we, which keeps on going approximately to the op optimum. We are tracking a random probability distribution which is going towards pi star. Okay, so here is mean field SVGD, and here is VP SVGD. It is mu t plus one uh, given f t plus one is equal to i minus gamma g t push forward of mu t given f t, where g t is this stochastic approximation of h mu t given f t, right? We just killed the teeth virtual particle and then we approximated the stochastic gradient or the gradient with the stochastic gradient. Okay, the nice thing about this is that expectation g t given f t is the stochastic gradient, right? Or uh, the projected stochastic gradient. Uh, you might be wondering, okay, this lives in an infinite dimensional space. What is this integral? Uh, we have integration theory, uh, relevant integration theory for this uh, called uh, gelfand Pettis integral, uh, which works in Hilbert spaces. And uh, this is equal to the thing in expectation in terms of the gelfand Pettis integral. Right. Um, so therefore, what we can say is that uh, with uh, by looking at SGD versus gradient descent, we can say that the dynamics of VP SVGD is a stochastic approximation of the mean field SVG, right? Okay, so therefore, uh, to obtain conditionally IID samples from mu t given ft, uh, t plus n particles are sufficient, right? It's just polynomial in t and n. Okay, so here's our main result. Yeah, please. ft is the sigma algebra of the uh, of the first t virtual particles at time zero. So we have sacrificed some particles and it, the, uh, the evolution only depends on them. So given that, they're IID. Yeah, those particles really yeah correct. Really correct. Right, so here is the main result. So uh, we assume that you know the kernel is nice enough and F is L smooth and the uh, uh, target is sub-Gaussian. We can of course make it much, much more general than this. We can remove the sub-Gaussianity, we can, probably remove smoothness to some extent and we can make the kernel much more general. Um, so we let S be the uniformly random between one to T. Okay. So condition on the virtual particles, so, you know, X not L, L less than or equal to T and S, the outputs are IID samples from the probability distribution, mu S given, you know, X not one to X not S, right? There is some probability distribution. There is a random probability distributions from which we are drawing IID samples. And this random probability distribution mu tilde satisfies the following uh, uh, equation. That is with high probability, this is close to pi star in KSD, right? So expectation KSD square is less than or equal to KL at uh, time zero divided by gamma T plus gamma square T. Okay, this B and L are constants depending on the kernel and F, smoothness of F and so on. Okay. The convergence rates, if you pick the right gamma is uh, D to the one third divided by T to the one sixth. Right? There's no log log, there is no curse of dimensionality. We just showed that, okay, we sampled N IID samples from a random probability distribution, which is close to the target. Okay, so like I said, sub can be um, relaxed to sub quadratic tail growth, that is pi star of X is proportional to E to the minus, let's say X to the alpha or something, and then it will all still work. And you know, the kernel need not be RBF, it can be you know, some matter kernel or even polynomial kernel and so on. So now uh, we, we saw that, okay, prior literature considered the approximation of the population distribution with the empirical distribution of N particles. Okay, so just to, I mean, it still must suffer from the curse of dimensionality, but for the sake of completeness, we'll still give bounds based on our uh, KSD bounds. Okay. So the empirical distribution of the VPS VGD output satisfies uh, KSD of mu hat to the N to pi star is D square over N to the theta one over D. Uh, this n to the theta one over d can't be improved. Uh, I think so uh, because there are too many open sets. Um, however, this is already a double exponential improvement over prior state of the art rates by given by Shi and Mackey. And um, this is the fastest uh, known finite particle rate for any SVDGD style algorithm. And um, this result also applied to tar targets with subquadratic growth. And this is one of the weakest assumptions in literature to guarantee convergence. Um, okay, so this might not seem very practical, the algorithm which I described, because uh, we had to have t extra particles to track their distribution and then n particles per part of the output. 
Uh, so what we can do is we consider something called a global batch SVGD, right? Which is a chimera between the actual SVGD and uh, virtual particle SVGD. What we do is that, okay, it's a random batch, right? If there are only N particles and we pick a random batch of particles as the, instead of the virtual particles at every time step and use the same random batch to run the dynamics for every particle, right? And then output uh, and get the output, right? Instead of using all the N particles to uh, uh, run the SVGD update. We just use a random batch. So this is like say computationally efficient approximation, stochastic approximation of uh, SVGD. And uh, this also has a rapid finite particle convergence, which cannot be proved for instance, for the full SVGD, right? This also converges as one over n to the power theta of one over d. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, no, I mean, no, not this one. This cannot be improved, I think. Yeah, yeah, because uh, n particles cannot approximate, uh, like, yeah. Even if the, it's from IID from the same distribution, it's hard to do. Uh, so, yeah, so, yeah. In, yeah, correct, in SVGD, that is. Subset, yeah. A small batch, okay. Oh, so we pick the right K. We assume that we pick the correct K. Very small, like one or something. Uh, so this is the this is for the pop uh, this empirical distribution to the population. So you can't have to. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, it depends on how you draw the random subset. If it's without replacement, then you there, there you can still divide this into virtual particles plus non-virtual particles. And if n is large enough, this is not distinguishable from PSVGD. It's just that we are outputting the virtual particles too. Right, it says, yeah, that's how we are. Unwilling. I mean, even with replacement sampling, when uh, n is much, much larger than t, with high probability, it won't repeat it, right? It's still equivalent to that. They can be coupled. Correct. But if n is much larger than t, the significant fraction of that will be the real particles, previously real particles. So it's quite close. I, I mean, it's not a very satisfactory answer, I guess, but it's the analysis. Yeah. yeah, but we can do that with k particles. No, it can be one, two, any k. It works for any k. The batch size can make it. Yeah, it can be, yeah. I mean, KT should be less than N. Much smaller than that's, that's Correct. Yeah, so the set of virtual particles is a small fraction of that. So it doesn't corrupt the output. Cool. Uh, yeah, I guess I have a few more minutes. I'll just give you a brief proof sketch. This is actually mimics the proof of SVGD. This is lemma one is a stochastic descent lemma. The, so if you write KL of mu t plus one given ft given pi star to pi star is less than or equal to KL for mu t given ft to pi star minus gamma h mu t given ft comma gt uh, with respect to the inner product is with respect to the RKHS plus this quantity. So this is very similar to how we analyze stochastic gradient descent. Uh, so this is derived using like the uh, morally the first order Taylor approximation of uh, KL. Uh, and then we use the Gelfand Pettis integral and show that, okay, this uh, GT given FT, uh, expectation GT given FT is H mu T given FT. That is, it's an unbiased estimator of uh, the actual gradient. Uh, and uh, therefore this is, this is basically the SGD style descent lemma. And uh, uh, we, we will then show that, okay, uh, norm of this needs to be bounded for this to work. We show that this is less than or equal to gamma t to the half, almost surely. Uh, this is done, uh, and then because of, this is done by showing that by smoothness, gt is less than or equal to c1 plus c2 times norm of the iterate. And then, um, you know, this, there's a gradient descent type argument, which we show that, okay, this cannot be too large. The iterates cannot 
go too fast to infinity, right? And because of that, uh, this is still bounded. And um, growth condition on F implies that it doesn't escape to infinity very fast. Okay. So now we get this, and then uh, controlling this in expectation, we show that uh, expectation of this is H mu T given Ft squared. And expectation gt squared is less than or equal to gamma t plus this quantity. And then uh, we know that uh, uh, by definition of KSD, this is the norm of h mu t given ft in the RKHS norm. And then by just writing down the descent lemma, we get this uh, output. And uh, the proof is completed using you know, convexity of KSD and the fact that s is output is one of the uniformly drawn times from 0 to t minus 1. So, to conclude, okay, seven seconds, I guess. We developed a computationally efficient variant of SVGD with provably fast convergence in the finite particle regime. This is the best known finite particle convergence with double exponential improvement over prior state of the art. And, uh, and this considers much weaker assumptions, which I did not go into. And um, the question we have for future work is that, uh, can we get uh, uh, first order stationarity guarantees without any isoparametric or tail decay assumptions on the target? We assume, for instance, like a stretched exponential concentration of the target measure. Can we remove that? Okay, so uh, can, is there any other application for virtual particle stochastic approximations to other geometries like Fisher Rao uh, or, or you know, even other problems used in the Wasserstein gradient flow? Something to think about. Thank you. So is it fair to say that the key intuition is to do the analysis through virtual particles? Yeah. Uh, so we, we don't try to get a finite particle system and then analyze it. We just try to stochast, uh, approximate the mean field limit directly. Directly through a stochastic approximation scheme. It's basically the difference between empirical risk minimization versus uh, one plus SVG, SGD. Right. So something like that. Yeah, they work quite well. We did experiments. So if you use G, uh, VPSVGD is not very practical because we have to kill T particles to go T time steps. But uh, if you use global G, batch SVGD, like uh, you, up, you, up, uh, you output even the virtual particles and then do something, it seems, fa it seems to match the performance of SVGD and it's actually much faster computationally because it's computationally simpler. For GBSVGD in certain regimes, but not in the regimes where it is uh, used. So I guess this can be used even in uh, like McKean Vlasov type equations that Lenik talked about in the yeah. morning session, right? Uh, yeah, it, it, I'm thinking about it, but it, I have not come across the right problem to think about it like in the background, where it, this would give an advantage. At least like theoretically. Theoretically, yeah. If there are no more questions, let's thank Dheeraj again. Uh, thanks, Dheeraj.